Okay, so I wanted to calculate the absorption cross-section for very slowly moving particles in the neighborhood of a Schwarzschild black hole. So the kind of problem that we were interested in was the black hole sitting here, a particle coming in with velocity v, which is small, at impact parameter b, and we were interested in the motion of the particle in this field, which we had decided was governed by the following set of equations. Half of du d phi all squared plus one half into u squared minus u cubed plus two e plus four m squared epsilon over L squared U is equal to 2M squared over L squared into E squared plus epsilon. That's where we got 2. And epsilon was equal to minus 1 because we were dealing with time-like particles. So this object we referred to as the total energy in inverted commas. And this thing we refer to as the potential energy. Again, in inverted commas. And we drew pictures of the potential energy and qualitatively saw that there had to be three cases. When uh, So when L... Uh, m squared over L squared is small, then this term here is not going to make a huge amount of difference. And so that you ended up with something which looks like this. And as you increase m squared over L squared, the height of this peak is going to decrease. So we call this case 2. And then lastly, if you increase it further, the peak just simply disappears and you end up with a picture that looks like that. So to proceed further with our task, what we have to do is to look and see what the total energy is going to be for non-relativistic motion. Well, if we go back to our definition of E, E, remember, the constant of integration we're interested in was R dot minus v of r times t dot. So as, t go, as r goes to infinity, corresponding to being out here in this picture, this expression goes to, roughly speaking, r dot minus t dot plus r dot. So this is, roughly speaking, t dot. So out at infinity, you know exactly what that is. e is equal to 1 over the gamma factor, because out near infinity, you just simply get flat space. The rules of special relativity will hold. And if you expand this out for small values of the velocity, meaning non-relativistic motion, you will discover that this is, roughly speaking, 1 plus a half v squared plus lots of other stuff. That, of course, you know. This you would think of as being the rest mass. This you think of as being the kinetic energy. And then there is higher order corrections to that. We can now calculate what we called the total energy here. What we call the total energy is equal to 2m squared over L squared 
into e squared plus epsilon. Well, e squared in this approximation is roughly 1 plus v squared plus higher order stuff, which we don't care about, minus 1. So this is equal to 2m squared v squared over l squared plus higher order stuff that we don't care about. And so if v goes to 0 as l is fixed, the total energy is going to 0. So that tells you, roughly speaking, that if you're in a situation like this, then of course a particle comes in from infinity, that's u equals 0. Even if the energy is very small, by energy I mean this expression here, the analog energy, it will never get over this peak. Whereas if you are in case 2, you are guaranteed it will get over the peak because this thing is positive, it may be going to 0, so the total energy in this language is about there. So the dividing line between capture and bouncing out, or not getting anywhere near it, is the dividing line between case 1 and case 2. And that's easy to calculate where that's going to be. What we call the potential energy, in inverted commas, is this function here. That's equal to a half into u squared minus u cubed plus 4m squared uh, u over l squared, and that's a minus sign, because epsilon is equal to minus 1. The dividing line between case 1 and case 2, obviously, is when this place, u max, we can call this u max, the height of this hump ends up at being 0. So the dividing line between case two, 1 and case 2 will occur for u max equals 0 and u prime equals 0. So that's easy to do. You don't have to solve any cubics to do this calculation. Let's take this thing and look at its zeros. Uh, so there were zeros at u squared minus u plus 4m squared over l squared equals 0. I have taken out the obvious 0 at u equals 0. That's dull. u prime, on the other hand, being put equal to 0, I just have to differentiate this thing. If I differentiate it, I will end up with a 3u squared from that term. From here, I will end up with a 2u, and I'll change the overall sign. And from differentiating this thing, I'll end up with plus 4m squared over l squared. Unsurprisingly, therefore, you are able to calculate the value of u by subtracting the 2. You will find u is equal to a half. And that, when substituted back in, will give you that 16m squared over l squared has got to be equal to 1. Now we need to know the value of l. l, recall, was r squared phi dot. So if you project a particle in from infinity with velocity v and impact parameter b, this is just equal to v times b the moment of the specific angular momentum. So this tells me that 16m squared over v squared b squared is equal to 1, is a dividing line, and therefore b 
squared is equal to 16m squared over b squared. If b is greater than this critical value, let's call this b critical, the particle will just simply zip by the black hole. Let's say if it's way out here for huge values of b, it will just simply be deflected a little bit from its trajectory like that. No capture. If b is less than bc, then it's captured and will just simply fall in, corresponding to some trajectory that looks like this. Maybe it will orbit the thing a few times, maybe not. And so the capture cross-section is equal to it's pi times bc squared, or alternatively 16 pi m squared over b squared. So that's the result capture cross-section for the Schwarzschild black hole for slowly moving particles. You might be alarmed by this result because you will say as v goes to zero this diverges. Surely there is something peculiar about that. And the answer is yes, there is something peculiar about it, but it's exactly what you'd expect. Suppose that you put a particle here, not quite at infinity, but at rest. What will happen? Well, it will just simply slowly fall in. But it's inevitably going to fall in because there's nothing to stop it falling in. It, the fact that this cross-section diverges as v goes to zero is a consequence of the fact that gravitational, gravitation is purely attractive. There are no repulsive forces in gravity, and so this kind of divergence is perfectly reasonable and physical. discussions of scattering in quantum field theory, you have come across bounds on the cross-section, which says that cross-sections can't in fast, increase faster than something. Is that true? One out of n. Uh, this violates that general bound um, and is a symptom of the fact that doing simple things in quantum field theory with gravity does not work. So you ought to be alarmed by a result that looks like that. But if you're not, well, never mind. So that's what happens if you try to calculate cross-sections. Um, something else that you might want to do is to ask what happens to particles that actually fall into the black hole? What kind of things do you actually see when that happens? So we want to go back to our original discussion of the geodesic equation. So we were contemplating a situation in the Penrose diagram that looks like this, and we were asking what happens to particles which move in this kind of direction. So again, you need to calculate what happens in v r theta phi coordinates, because t is, of course, a little bit misleading, especially when you get close to the horizon. So if you look back to what happened when you looked at the geodesic equations, uh, let's see. Let's do this radially. So I'll just contemplate radial motion.
So in other words, L is equal to 0. What does a geodesic equation become? Well, the answer is um, r squared, r dot squared, minus e squared over v of r is equal to minus 1, where v of r is equal to 1 minus 2m over r. In this particular case, it is much easier to use r than u. Dot here, I'm interested in particle motion. So epsilon is equal to minus 1. And dot means d by d proper time for that particle. I will call the proper time for the particle tau. So this describes the motion of a radially infalling particle um, with energy E. It's useful to solve this equation. The easy way to do this is to write that r dot squared, uh, that r dot is equal to e squared minus v to the one half. And if I'm interested in radially infalling objects, I better give myself a minus sign here to indicate that r is decreasing. So this is minus e squared minus 1 plus 2m over r to the 1 half. And to integrate that up is really easy. So the kind of thing that you might want to do is to start here at a value of r equal to big R. And let's write it the way around. So start at big R and go to some arbitrary value of R later. So if I do that, I just need to integrate up this equation. And it reads, it's obviously a separable equation. The proper time interval, delta tau, is integral from R to big R of dr over e squared minus 1 plus 2m over r to the 1 half. So that tells you the proper time to go from the point big R, somewhere in the exterior, to the point little r, wherever it is. I suppose we could put primes on this so that we don't become confused about what we mean by r. So that tells me all I really need to know about what happens to a particle that's falling in to the black hole. It may not be entirely obvious how to do this integral. Tempted to ask for suggestions. Well, the answer is that you make a clever substitution. The clever substitution that you need to make had better account for the fact that you want to go from r equals 0 to r equals infinity, because no one told you what the actual value of r is going to be. Um, and you better make sure that nothing weird happens at r equals 2m, which is where something is likely to peculiar to happen. So I think that the easiest thing to do is to turn this thing uh, into something nice using a hyperbolic substitution. You want to make e squared minus 1 come out of this thing. e, of course, is just a constant of integration related to the energy of the particle. In other words, its velocity at the point big R. It's got to work for arbitrary e, so it's good to make this thing come out. So you better make that thing look something nice. And the obvious nice thing to do is to make it look like sine squared. So the substitution that you make 
to make the whole thing work is 2m over r prime equals e squared minus 1 sine squared theta. Actually, maybe using theta is bad because theta probably means something else in this problem. Then the thing in the denominator becomes simple. It's just going to be e squared minus 1 to the half comes out. 1 plus sine squared is cosh squared. You square root it, you get a cosh. So delta tau is the integral from r to big R. This thing gives me 1 over cosh of chi. Then I have to calculate dr prime. Well, let's see. I didn't do that in my notes. Oh, yes. Well, uh, the easy thing to do is to invert this thing. R prime is equal to 2m over e squared minus 1, 1 over sine squared chi. So dr prime is the same mess. Uh, I get a minus 2 from differentiating this, divide by sine cubed, and multiply by cosh, and give myself a d chi. So the total result is minus 4m over e squared. I don't care about the signs. e squared minus 1. Cosh over sine cubed. So all the unpleasant factors cancel, and you're left with the integral from r to big R, 4m over e squared minus 1 to the 3 halves. The cosh is, that cosh cancels that cosh, and you're left with d chi over sine cubed chi. So that looks a lot simpler. Did I get my factors of e squared right? Yes. Hopefully you can do that integral. And you will get 4m over e squared minus 1 to the 3 halves. And then you get cosh of chi over 2 sine cubed chi plus a half log tanch of a half chi. And an overall minus sign. And then you've got to evaluate this at the two endpoints. So it's chi of little r, chi of big r, which you'd have to work out from the formula up there. So that's the answer. I don't want to uh, go into much detail about this. The first obvious interesting fact is that suppose that you started off at this point here. And you sit on this particle and you fall into the black hole. What will happen to your proper time? Well, will anything peculiar happen when r is equal to 2m? And the answer is no. There are several ways in which you can see that. At r is equal to 2m, this expression here will just simply give me a 2m over 2m, so it's a 1. That cancels that 1, and I just have e squared to the 1 half, so it's an e. There is nothing non-integrable about that. So there is absolutely no singularity at r is equal to 2m. Another way of saying this is that at r equals 2m, sine chi is just 1 over the square root of e squared minus 1. There's nothing peculiar about that. There's nothing peculiar about cosh. There's nothing peculiar about tanch or its logarithm. So at r is equal to 2m, the 
proper time interval between starting to fall in and getting to the horizon is finite. So what well, and perfectly smooth. So what that means is that if you start here and fall through the horizon, you will not nothing peculiar will happen to you and nothing peculiar will happen to your clock. You will just simply keep falling and you will fall to r equals 0. Does anything peculiar happen at r equals 0? Well, if r goes to 0, this thing is going to plus infinity and that means that uh, where is our definition of chi? Chi is going to infinity. Let's look at this integral. If chi goes to infinity, this thing looks here roughly like e to the minus 2 chi. So there's nothing peculiar about that. This thing here, chi is going to infinity, tanch is going to 1, so the logarithm is going to 0. So again, the proper time interval remains finite. That tells you why you should be so scared of black holes. If you start here and fall in, you will reach the singularity after a finite amount of proper time. And then you will fall off the edge of space-time, whatever that means. Well, I don't like that idea. But there is nothing you can do about it. say is that a there is a crisis for an infalling test particle. Now that's fine. Uh, the history of late the second half of 20th century physics has been full of people who try to tell you that black holes don't exist. And fully 95% of these people have the following effect in mind. They say, well, here is somebody who is falling in, but it must be fiction for the following reason. Suppose you watch them. What will happen? Well, you can imagine this infalling observer producing flashes of light at regular intervals of proper time along the observer's world line. You sit at scry and you watch what happens. What happens is that these flashes of light will move along outgoing null geodesics from the world line of this particle out to infinity what will happen? Well, two things will happen which uh, cause a great deal of confusion. The first is, um, and it occurs to me that perhaps uh, Dr. Stewart didn't do this. Did you do the gravitational redshift? <laughs> that wasn't very energetic. Uh, I take that to be a very feeble yes. Um, there should be enthusiasm about this. So, uh, suppose that uh, the wavelength of light here is lambda e. What you observe at scry plus is lambda o, the observed thing, and you know how to calculate the difference. Lambda o divided by lambda e 
is equal to G00 at the place at which you emit it, divided by G00, the place at which you observe it, um, and I guess a square root. So that's the formula for gravitational redshift. That works in static space-times, of which the Schwarzschild solution is a great example. So, you observe at infinity the flash of light appears at to come from Re, so this is roughly speaking 1 minus 2m over Re to the 1 half. So, what happens is that as Re tends to 2m, lambda O becomes 0. That is to say that the horizon, R equals 2m, represents a surface of infinite redshift. So, your knowledge of what is going on for anything which is moving with this particle is rather severely limited by the fact that there is a huge redshift. So, less and less energy can be detected at infinity. In actual fact, the situation is worse than that, and you could even guess that it's worse than that from the following simple argument. If there is infinite time dilation between here and here, it must be that the wavelength is being stretched out. Well, that's kind of obvious, but that means that all time intervals are stretched out. And in particular, the time interval between here and here is becoming greater and greater and greater, even if <laughs> the proper time between here and here is fixed. That, after all, is all the gravitational redshift is about. It's, you look at a wave train representing some light. It has some proper time interval between its maxima. That's what happens if you are co-moving with this thing. By the time you observe it up here, it has become infinitely stretched out. So something else that you could do is to say, I'm going to be interested in asking, what is the time interval between these pulses? So I could say, I would like this time interval to be fixed in terms of the proper time on this observer's world line. So that this observer is producing regular pulses. What do you see out here? That is to say, what is the time interval up here between the pulses as you observe it? Let's call that, uh, well, that's the same thing as, of course, just the coordinate time, because r is going to infinity, v is going to 1, and therefore the proper time and the coordinate time will coincide. Yes? Friction Sorry? Lambda zero be infinite. Lambda observe no 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 far from it. Redshift makes things red. That oh you're absolutely right. <laughs> Thank you. Frequency is going to zero. Thank you. Um, So, the first thing to do is to calculate what these null geodesics are. Well, they're surfaces of constant retarded time. Uh, 
That is to say that t minus r minus 2m times logarithm of r minus 2m is equal to a constant. <coughs> so the change in t as r changes along these lines is just simply r delta r over r minus 2m. Now, what about these ingoing lines here? So that equation tells you about these things here. What about the ingoing things? What happens along this line? Well, delta r along the ingoing lines is r equals e squared minus 1 plus 2m over r to the 1 half times the proper time interval. So you can now relate a proper time interval to the proper time experienced by an observer out at infinity. pulses. As seen by an observer at infinity, given an interval delta tau along the world line of the infalling thing, Delta T we should call that interval is equal to E squared minus one plus two M over R to the half times R divided by R minus two M times delta tau. So, in other words, as r goes to 2m, the interval between pulses that you see at infinity tends to zero. Oh, sorry, tends to infinity. So that means that you have to wait an infinite amount of time to see the observer cross the horizon, uh, this infalling thing cross the horizon. So, if you were intent on black hole watching, you would never see this thing fall in. This led 
vast numbers of people who should have known better to conclude that black holes don't exist because you can't see them. It ignores relativity completely. The whole point about relativity is that different observers see different things. So the co-moving, infalling observer sees something quite catastrophic. An observer which stays well away and behaves safely, of course, has nothing to fear and doesn't see anything interesting. That's just the way it works. It does not mean that black holes do not exist. It means that you cannot probe them directly, and that's one of the things which uh, makes them so peculiar. Can I have a question? You know you said about the gravitational redshift was only for static space. Yes. Does that change dramatically? Uh, right. So the question is, what happens if you did this in the Kerr metric? Because it's not static. Or an expanding universe. OK, so an expanding universe where you don't have rotating black holes, it won't make any difference except there's no infinity. You have to make do with a long, long way away from the black hole. Then it's the same. If you have rotating black holes, then it turns out to be much more complicated. The infinite redshift surface is always outside the horizon. But um, we probably don't have time. Well, we might have time to do that. So, so let's say I'm falling into a black hole and I'm, I'm emitting pulse of set, say, femtosecond intervals with right. very high precision or something like this. Towards the closer I get to the horizon, the observer in the sky plus is going to start seeing them, those femtoseconds turn into days, years, something. Like days, years, eons? Yeah. So, so, but, so the, the precision that I have. And it gets redder and redder and redder. And redder and redder. But so, so or let's say, or let's say I had a, even a slower clock or something like this. But it, but I had the intervals between pulses timed very accurately. Mm -hmm. The person, the observer at Sky Plus, could could observe them to an enormously higher accuracy than I could have done done it because he's got he's longer to do it in. Yes, lots of time to do it in. Now, can I do it backwards? And if I was at Sky minus, if sending pulses in, I could tune my pulses very well so that, they, so that the observers world were, were coming in would see very, very, very regular pulses. I mean, way beyond any kind of normal experimental things. And then send them back out to Scry Plus, um, in which case you get enormous amplification of the precision of your experiment. Hmm. That would be completely true classically. I'm not sure that works when you think about individual photons. Yeah, I know. I think this is, this is starting to tie in. You were under all sorts of problems with uncertainty relations pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Because it, there's also energy time correlations because... Absolutely. Uh, my guess is that if pursued to its bitter end, this reasoning would have discovered the Hawking effect. Hmm. We will discover the Hawking effect. Unfortunately, it's been already discovered. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't want to discourage you, uh, but I think it's a fruitful line of reasoning. Um, people who study quantum information often amuse themselves with ideas like this. Uh, I don't know it's ever done, well, it's never done them any harm. Um, and indeed, there are some who still think that the Bekenstein bound on the rate of computation, which is essentially derived by that kind of reasoning, uh, works. Um, I, I personally don't think it does work, but for an entirely different reason. So I think that the, the line of reasoning is interesting and fruitful, okay. probably still. Uh, this will cause an enormous digression. <laughs> um, but yes, you could imagine doing experiments like that, and I'm sure that there must be lots of people who have tried it, but I don't, I don't know quite what I don't know much about the details of that. Um, well, we keep talking about black holes. Um, at some level, we haven't really sort of seen how they formed or why they should form. So what I wanted to do next was to see what goes wrong with trying to make massive objects of small size. We all have this basic idea that a black hole is a region of space in which there is a lot of mass concentrated. And roughly speaking, the intuition that we have developed is that if, of course this is based on Newtonian theory, that if an amount 
of matter, say mass m, lies within a region of size r, and r is less than 2m, then you will have a black hole. This is a rather loosely stated uh, hypothesis because I haven't told you what size r means. Neither have I given you a very clear way in which you could possibly understand what m means. Nevertheless, this goes by the name of the hoop conjecture. Hoop is a thing, not a person. And a proof of this is due, at least a version of this, is due to Yao in roughly 1990. However, his theorem is beyond us. So the simplest thing to do is just to see what goes wrong if you try to construct solutions with more than a certain amount of mass in a given region. So the idea is to try and construct stars which are hugely dense. So what we want to do is instead of looking at vacuum solutions of the Einstein equations, we want to look at solutions with some matter in it and see what goes on when you try to have an interior solution as well as looking at space-time outside something. So what you really want to do then is to imagine that you have some kind of blob of matter We will assume that it is spherically symmetric and static, at least to start with. Outside the matter, we of course know what happens. The metric must be given by the Schwarzschild metric. Let's suppose that the surface of this object is at, um, now, what did I call it? Yes, big R. So for R bigger than big R, the metric is ds squared equals minus into 1 minus 2m over r dt squared plus dr squared into the same thing to the minus 1. For r less than r, the metric must still be static. And an easy way to write it is minus e to the 2 phi, which is going to be a function of r times dt squared, plus dr squared over 1 minus 2, and I'm going to write this as m of r divided by r, plus r squared, the omega 2 squared, and you would like the things to match up properly at r equals 2m, sorry, at r equals big R, which tells you that e to the 2 phi of big R is minus 1 minus 2m over R. Phi of R is equal to 1 half 
times the logarithm of 1 minus 2m divided by big R. And you would like the GRR component to match up. So m of big R is equal to m. And now what you have to do is to solve the Einstein's equations. So you need to have some energy momentum tensor. TAB to describe the matter. Um, well, typically what you do is you just say that the typical kind of energy momentum tensor of matter is the following object. Suppose that the matter has got pressure P. Energy density rho and four velocity u. Then the energy momentum tensor is going to be equal to P plus rho U A U B plus P times G A B. And since U is a four velocity we will assume that ua, ua is equal to minus 1. In other words, the thing is properly normalized as if they were time-like particles. I hope that you have all seen this expression before. OK. Uh, we should probably stop there for today. You can only send it, you can only emit maybe some x number of pulses before you enter the horizon. And so the number that you'll emit to infinity are, is, is fixed, right? And there's a conservation of number of pulses. So at infinity, eventually you'll see one longest one and then never again. Oh no! Not in a case where you have gravitational collapse. No, no, no I'm talking about an um, uh, observer going into a static short shield, or going into a short shield. You're going to admit some X number of photons before you go out, before you hit, hit the board. Oh, photons, yes, because you've only got a finite energy source. Yeah. I mean, well, no, 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 no. Uh, well, you could reflect I'm, them. I'm, I'm talking about emitting sources at, at regular intervals of proper time. Uh, <laughs> so you're talking about an observer that does that? Yep. And along regular intervals of that line, it's emitting but you can absorb, you can do that. Of course, there could be an infinite number of these things because the infinite, there's an infinite amount of time between there and there. What I mean is that the uh, certain. <laughs> you're infalling, and yeah, so I'm, I'm coming in like this, OK? And I'm emitting pulses off to sky plus. You can do that, yeah. And I'm going to do this at regular intervals here. There's going to be some fixed number of pulses I'm going to send off. I'm going to do it every atto second or something like this. Oh yeah, pretty well, simple experiment. As long as you as long as you don't go back to minus infinity, that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to start some fixed time, and I'm just going to start emitting pulses. And at infinity, eventually, if you're sitting up here looking at things, eventually you're going to see one longest pulse, and then yes. you're never going to see another one. That's right. Again. That's right. Yeah. And the number of that you're going to see and how big the longest pulse is is going to be very sensitively timed to, to where you are relative to the horizon. That's yeah. also true. Yeah. yeah. And so if you have like femtosecond pulses or attosecond pulses, you have a, you'll get a you'll get a better precision up here. But if you have like one minute pulses or something like this, you'll have much worse precision. That's there. absolutely true. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I always thought this information theory black holes <laughs> very interesting. Well, it led to a lot of interesting things. Um, there's, there were some good talks at Tassie this year. That. About that? Yeah. I can believe that. You, you go and talk to people in the quantum information group. So John, Jonathan Oppenheim has uh, studied that kind of thing. Um, I'm not quite sure what his results were. I think they might be time dependent. <laughs>